Um, welcome, everyone. I am Lynn Kinst, Executive Director of the Hemophilia Council of California. And so happy to welcome you to our last webinar of 2024. Where did this year go? Um, this is the topic is aging with a bleeding disorder, how to access Medicare. And so um, we want to go ahead and jump right in. Um, so, okay, that went all the way to the very end of my slide deck instead of to the next slide. Let's see. Thank you, uh, first of all, to some of our sponsors who make these webinar series possible. Um, and we want to remind everyone that we do have translation available so you can follow in the meeting controls. Um, I think it may be under more now. It used to just be you could see the interpretation there and click on that and go to either English or Spanish. And we will put this information in the chat as well. Um, and then this is for Android and iOS devices if you're on your phone. Okay, so just a couple quick housekeeping items. Um, we would encourage you, please keep your phone or your computer on mute until we open it up for Q&A. Um, and if you're on your phone and you, you can always use star six to mute or unmute. Um, we also remind everyone that neither the Hemophilia Council of California nor our speaker today are providing legal counsel or medical advice and that we are recording this webinar and it will be posted at a later date. Um, so briefly, the council is here to coordinate statewide access and education and advocacy efforts on behalf of individuals living with bleeding disorders and other rare and chronic conditions here in California. Um, and it is our mission to improve access to care and treatment options in order to advance the quality of life for people with bleeding disorders through advocacy, education, and outreach. So with all of that, we are going to jump right into our topic today. We are pleased to have with us Ben Hudson, who is the Training Director for State Health Insurance Assistance, or SHIP, program in, uh, in, in the, the Indiana Department of Insurance. And um, Ben is going to share his expertise on Medicare with us this evening. So Ben, I'm going to let you take it away. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Lynn, for that wonderful introduction. Thanks for having me tonight. So as you mentioned, I am from Indiana. It's 9.30 at night here. Um, so I'll be getting my pajamas here in the next 30 minutes by the time we're done. But our goal today is to kind of do a nice high-level overview of the Medicare program in regards to how do I enroll, when do I enroll, the cost. And to be honest, really answering the big question is, do I need Medicare? Where do I fit in? And what are those choices that maybe I have? Along the way, we'll be able to kind of fit in some California-specific information in regards to additional insurances you may qualify for, like Medi-Cal or the Genetic Handicapped Persons Program you have, especially in California, a really neat program I've learned about in the last couple of weeks. Um, as you mentioned, I am the training director for the state of Indiana for Medicare through the Indiana State Health Insurance Assistance Program. Our particular division is actually federally funded through the federal government, and there is a SHIP program in every state as well as U.S. territories like Puerto Rico. So there's somebody just like me, and there's about 15,000 Medicare counselors uh, across the United States. So California has their own SHIP-like program as well, all getting their funding from the same place. I also contract and provide continuing education services across the U.S., presentations across the U.S., and really help train insurance agents in a way that they can are really helping people in a more ethical, moral way in regards to their Medicare options. Go ahead, next slide, please. On our agenda today, we're going to start with just a high-level overview again of what the Medicare program could look like. We'll answer that question in regards to when do I actually enroll into Medicare. I'll scare you a little bit with the cost of Medicare. We actually just heard this week some confirmation from Medicare about some of the new prices in Medicare for 2025. So I'll share that with you guys hot off the press. And then most importantly, we'll round this out talking about Medicare resources. I'll tell you right now, 30 minutes is not enough to really learn Medicare in any kind of way that I think will help you ultimately enroll necessarily, but this will get you started. This will get you in contact with individuals like myself, 
as well as California's Medicare counselors information I put at the end of today's presentation as well. The big question we tend to ask is what is Medicare? You know, if we were to ask, throw a survey out there these days across the United States and ask people what is Medicare, I think most people these days would correctly state that Medicare is what my grandparents had. Medicare is what my parents had maybe. And statistically that is correct. The largest group of people who are simply entitled or eligible for Medicare are US citizens who turn 65 years old. If you're not a U.S. citizen, as long as you are lawfully present in the United States for five years and you're 65 years old, you also become entitled to the exact same Medicare benefits as somebody else. It doesn't necessarily matter how much you've worked, how much you have paid into the tax system. Your sheer eligibility, your opportunity to sign up for Medicare is just based on you turning 65 years old. Now, when we talk about how much money you make, how much okay. you paid in taxes over the years, that can come into play when we talk about the price Everything of Medicare. Right. But again, your sheer eligibility for Medicare is just solely based on you turning 65 years old. That's one of the biggest or main reasons as to why. Next slide, please. Some other opportunities, aside from turning 65 years old, some smaller subgroups, if you're under 65 years old and you are on social security disability, specifically for two years or 24 months, you are also then entitled to that exact same Medicare. So I could be a 35 year old person, been on disability for a couple years, and I can then immediately begin my Medicare on that first day of my 25th month, the first day after my full two years on disability. The last group at the bottom of this slide, as well as really the newest group and statistically the smallest group, is any person at any age in their lifetime that they are diagnosed with end-stage renal disease, they kind of get singled out and they actually also have an opportunity to sign up for Medicare just solely based on their condition. Next slide, please. What we'll kind of dig into today are some of the big parts of Medicare. And I think this is, you know, common practice and things that many of you have probably heard about over the years, all right? On the left-hand side here, we see some benefits provided directly by Medicare, what I'll call the government in this instance. When you sign up for Medicare, you could sign up for Medicare Part A, what we call your hospital insurance. This is what would cover you if you were ever formally admitted to the hospital or maybe a skilled nursing facility, like a short-term rehab stay. Medicare Part A would be that portion of Medicare that could cover you. Medicare Part B is actually the opposite and probably the more highly utilized portion of Medicare because this is everything outpatient related, everything from all your free preventative services, your yearly checkups, your flu shots, all the way to durable medical equipment, ambulance rides, outpatient chemotherapy, for example, anything where you're not quite literally admitted to the hospital, Medicare Part A could cover that for you. That is one of the first confusing things about Medicare. Okay? Most of us have health insurance from our employers where we just kind of generically have health insurance. We go to the doctor, we get admitted to the hospital, and our health insurance just pays for that. For Medicare, though, they split up that inpatient and outpatient services. So when I'm eligible for Medicare, I'm signing up for my parts of Medicare. If I didn't sign up for the Part B, I don't have outpatient coverage. If I don't sign up for the Part A, I don't have inpatient coverage. So once you're signing up for Medicare, and we'll talk about when you can do that, but for most of us to be considered fully insured, we're really going to want to sign up for at least that Medicare Part A and Part B. Right below that, you'll see that word optional and the other word that says Medigap. So Medigap or Medicare supplement plans are effectively private insurance plans that have been approved by your individual state's Department of Insurance. And those extra insurance policies are there and made to work after the government's Medicare. So if you're someone getting your Medicare directly from Medicare, directly from the government, those Medigap plans are made to pay those leftover bills. So maybe Medicare only pays 80% of your ambulance ride. That Medigap plan could step in and pay the remaining 
It is an extra cost. It's an extra fee that we'll talk about. But for many people, if you have naturally high medical costs, you're always paying, you know, four or $5,000 a year in leftover medical bills after insurance pays, maybe $120 a month extra for insurance that would cover that four or $5,000 actually ends up being more cost effective for you. Okay. So not a requirement, but really highly recommended okay, when you have the government's Medicare. The alternative then on the right hand side, you'll notice there's really two pathways for your Medicare, either Medicare provided by the government directly or Medicare provided by a private insurance company that actually works with or has been approved by Medicare. So what we mean by that is I could actually join something called a Medicare Part C plan or a Medicare Advantage plan. These are Medicare from private insurance companies, like you see all the commercials on TV, a Humana Medicare Advantage plan, a United Medicare Advantage plan, for example. Medicare has approved those private insurance companies to actually administer your Medicare Part A and B benefits to you. So your tax dollars actually go from the government to that private insurance company, and they are in charge of your Part A and B claims. They are in charge of approvals and denials and kind of deciding how long you can stay in the hospital, for example. But they are following Medicare's rules within reason, minimums and maximums set by the government, and they're getting paid pretty handsomely from the federal government as well. The last piece of this puzzle is all the way to the right, and that is Medicare Part D. Medicare Part D, in a nutshell, is really just going to act like normal drug insurance that maybe you have right now. You'll take your prescriptions from your doctor, go to your favorite pharmacy, and your Part D will pay the majority, hopefully, of those covered drugs for you. You may be left with, of course, some sort of flat copay, $4, $5 for some drugs, maybe more like hundreds of dollars for other drugs left over, depending on the price. All right? Now, we'll make some clarifications a little bit later on in this presentation about how Medicare covers uh, blood factors and other kind of specialty items here relating to this particular demographic. All right, next slide, please. One of the most important slides in this presentation, for those of you who are maybe upcoming on Medicare here in the new, near future, is this next one up on the screen. When you talk to me, you talk to your trusted insurance agent, you talk to your Medicare counselor from your SHIP program in California, you're really being presented with two main pathways. What we have is option one in the middle column and option two on the right-hand side. Option one effectively is just getting the government's Medicare A and B, what we'd call original Medicare as it was originally created decades ago. So I'm gonna sign up for my Medicare Part A, my Part B directly from the government. I'll pick up my Part D plan, or maybe I got some other drug insurance from somewhere else. And then as an option, I'm tacking on a Medicare supplement plan to pay those leftover bills for me. Why you keep seeing the supplement plan kind of pop up as a secondary insurance recommendation is a really weird fact about the government's Medicare. Medicare in and of itself is great insurance. It's gonna cover most everything most individuals would need for the rest of their lives. But what is abnormal about the government's Medicare is there is no max out of pocket. Most insurances, there's maybe a 5,000 or even a $10,000 limit. So if you ever owed that much money out of your pocket, you don't owe another penny the rest of the year. Original Medicare Part A and B do not actually have that maximum. So although maybe Part B pays 80% of all your Part B claims and only leaves you with 20%, that 20% has no limit to it. So we kind of call that a, a theoretical unlimited amount of leftover medical bills. So to protect you in those what if situations, what if you have an expensive year, you know, tons of doctor's appointments, surgeries, hospitalization, to protect you from owing a theoretical unlimited leftover amount of bills, you'll simply want to make sure you have secondary coverage. The majority of individuals across the U.S. would sign up for a Medicare supplement plan. Those are actually standardized across the United States, where others of you may have other insurance available. Maybe you qualify for Medicaid or Medi Medi-Cal there in California. Maybe you have a retiree plan from your former job. Maybe you have TRICARE for life as a retired military person. Effectively, the goal is 
If you decide to go with option one and get your Medicare from the government, it is highly recommended that you have some extra insurance to pay those what if bills, all those leftover bills for you. Option two on the right hand side, just to reiterate, would be those Medicare Advantage plans. So instead of allowing the government to act like my insurance company, I can actually get my Medicare from an insurance company. So the government again sends my tax dollar, sends my money over to Humana maybe. And Humana is responsible at a minimum for covering my Part A claims, my Part B claims, and then they'll also probably bundle in some extra things. They'll include that Part D plan. They'll include the free gym membership, dental, vision, hearing, all things that original Medicare from the government would not provide. At an absolute minimum, on the left-hand side, this is technically maybe an undisclosed or untalked about third option. It's what I call the minimum coverage once you're eligible for Medicare. The government says you have to have at least Part A, Part B, and now since 2006, you'll have to have Part D as well. As long as you have those three things, you've done everything you need to do to avoid Medicare penalties. Believe it or not, yes, they'll actually penalize you for not signing up for Medicare at the right time. The government says as long as you have the A, the B, and the D, you've done everything you need to do at a minimum to avoid those penalties. And are there plenty of people across the U.S. that just have the government's A, B, and D? Absolutely. Some would just say that maybe they're taking a little bit of a risk with all those theoretical unlimited leftover bills. So if you're going to do the minimum, the government's A, B, and D, highly recommended to really look in that option one column and make sure you have access to some secondary coverage, like a supplement or possibly Medicaid if you qualify. Next slide, please. So big question, how do you actually enroll into it? So for those of you who are receiving Social Security prior to the age of 65, so this could be those of you who retire early, started taking Social Security retirement, maybe at 62, 63, 64, or those of you on Social Security disability, maybe far younger than 65, that still counts. So if you're on Social Security of any kind prior to being 65, or you're on disability, you will actually be automatically enrolled into at least the Part A and the Part B. Social Security is the government agency in charge of Medicare enrollment, so they already know who you are. They're already sending you money every, every month, either through retirement checks or your disability checks, so they know when you're going to turn 65, or they know when you're going to hit that 24th month or 25th month, rather, on disability. So they just save you a step. About three months before your 65th birthday, you're going to walk out to your mailbox and you're going to see that red, white, and blue Medicare card waiting for you. And you can just hold on to that okay, until you're the first day of your 65th birthday month, like November 1st, or maybe the first day of your 25th month on disability. And that's when that Medicare could begin for you, just simply automatically. One thing to note, though, Part C, the Medicare Advantage plan enrollment, as well as Part D, drug plan enrollment, is something that's not typically automatic for you. That's something you'll have to proactively decide on, pick a plan from a certain company, and actually physically enroll yourself into that plan all by yourself. Right. Now, for those of you who are maybe turning 65 years old, but you don't want to take Social Security yet, you know, for many of us, our full Social Security retirement age is not until 67 years old now, potentially. So those of you may want to sign up for Medicare at 65 because you're eligible for it, but you're not quite taking Social Security yet. If you're not taking Social Security like we just talked about, then the government doesn't really know you're ready for Medicare. And on this slide, you'll see three different enrollment periods for when you can actually get yourself signed up for Medicare. The first one would be called that initial enrollment period. This is a seven-month window that surrounds your 65th birthday month. So it starts three months before your birthday month, includes your birthday month, and then three months afterwards. Big seven-month window. As long as you get yourself signed up for Medicare within those seven months, you're good to go. One thing we didn't talk about was on one of our slides earlier. I just kind of skipped over that. The one way that you are actually allowed to 
delay Medicare past the age of 65, is if you are still planning on continuing to work and have insurance from a company that's larger than 20 employees. The same thing could be true if maybe you're already retired, but your spouse is still working and your spouse can cover you under their employer plan from a company larger than 20 employees. So essentially, as long as you have that active employer health insurance plan, you do not have to sign up for Medicare just because you're turning 65 or just because you're hitting your two-year mark on disability. You have the ability to delay that until you retire or really otherwise just lose that employer insurance. That is really the only way to delay Medicare, to have that active employer plan. If you're, turn, if you're 64 right now on Medi-Cal, you have Medicaid right now, when you turn 65 years old, it's a requirement for you to sign up for Medicare. If you're already retired from your job and your job is offering you a retiree health plan and it's the best insurance in the world, doesn't matter. When you turn 65 years old, you'll have to sign up for Medicare because that plan is not tied to you actively working anymore. So just keep that in mind. As we're kind of going through these enrollment periods, you don't even have to worry about that seven month initial enrollment period if you are still covered by your employer plan or a spouse's. You could actually use the second bullet point called a special enrollment period. The government will actually give you eight extra months after you retire or otherwise lose your health insurance from your job to get yourself signed up for Medicare penalty free. And if you either sign up at 65 or maybe you'll wait until after you or your spouse retires. The last ditch opportunity is what we call the general enrollment period at the bottom. If you happen to not sign up at 65 because Uncle Bob at Thanksgiving told you you didn't have to worry about it, but Uncle Bob was wrong, or maybe you forgot to sign up for Medicare after you retired because HR told you some wrong information, the only time you could get signed up for Medicare then would be during this general enrollment period. The first three months of every year, you'll kind of have to call Social Security with the tail between your legs and say, oops, I made a mistake. I didn't sign up when I was supposed to. They'll let you on to Medicare because you call them between January and the end of March, but that's where penalties can start accumulating. Okay? For every year that you went without that Medicare past the age of 65, and you didn't have a good reason as to why you didn't sign up like you were still working, there's going to be a penalty for you for every one of those years you were without. It. Next slide, please. Let's skip this slide. So this slide, I put some extra slides in here for you guys as this is being posted online. You know, for time purposes, we can't cover everything, but this kind of has a little longer explanation in a written format of what we just discussed about those enrollment periods. Let's go next slide, please. As far as sign up is concerned, it's super simple these days. We're in the age of technology. We're really hitting a new generation of Medicare beneficiaries, our baby boomers turning 65 years old. Many of you have spent your adult lives with technology, computers, the internet, and you're asking for ways to really not have to interact with the government, if at all possible. So you are welcome to go to ssa.gov all by yourself. You can create a social security account, and you can actually fill out a Medicare application all by yourself, probably in about 10 to 15 minutes online. Of course, you can always call Social Security's 1-800 number and get enrolled over the phone. If you're a glutton for punishment, you like the DMV or the BMV, you can always go to Social Security in person and they can still help you out that way, of course. Next slide, please. All right, here's a big discussion on price. I had to bring a little bad news with me today. So we're gonna look at cost now. If you decided to go with option one, the government's Medicare, some drug insurance, and then maybe throw in one of those supplement plans. Medicare Part A is free for most people. That just simply is because you've paid enough tax dollars throughout your working career, all those little line items on your pay stubs that say Medicare and Social Security you grumble about. That actually gives you the Medicare Part A for free. Medicare Part B this year is $174.70 per month per person. It could be higher if you are a higher income person. The government says if you have as an individual over $103,000 of taxable income, you could actually pay a surcharge or a higher amount for your Medicare premium. You could also pay nothing for your Medicare premium. If you also end up qualifying for Medi-Cal or Medicaid in your state, 
your state could actually pay those Medicare premiums for you, okay? again, depending on income. The new premium for 2025, get your pens out. We just heard about this this week from the government. They have settled on a price of $185 even okay, per month per person for Medicare Part B, so 185. For Part D, our national Part D premium, what we call a base premium, is about $35 per month. Here in Indiana, we have plans actually as low as $0 per month all the way up to $120 next year, actually. So there's a huge variation in monthly price for Part D. It really depends on the prescriptions that you take and the county that you live in. So even in California, you are only allowed to purchase a Part D plan based on the county that you live in, not just the state of California, but the county that you live in. Okay? So there, there may be 20 Part D plans to choose from. Those are the only 20 you have to choose from and you're trying to find a plan that covers all your drugs and also does it for the best price. Medicare supplement, what we call a plan G. So the supplements are actually lettered also. So there's a plan A, a plan B, plan S, for example, just to add to the confusion. But we have something called a Medicare supplement plan G. This is kind of a top tier plan that's available to most of us these days and will almost quite literally pay all of your leftover medical bills for you you may have at most maybe just a couple hundred dollars to pay in medical bills in a year. To do that though, you're looking at probably close to about $125 per month per person at age 65 years old. You add all these things together, if you're doing the math here real quick, you could easily be at $350 to $400 per month per person to have the government's Medicare, some drug insurance, and then that extra supplement that's highly recommended because they're going to pay those leftover bills for you. So right there is kind of the value. You know, the usual candidate for someone who wants this option, who wants to go with the government's Medicare and a supplement, tends to be someone coming on to Medicare with pre-existing conditions. They know full well that they have lots of doctor's visits, lots of medical treatments, injections, surgeries, hospitalizations, whatever it may be. They just seem to always owe thousands of dollars in leftover bills, even after their insurance pays. By having Medicare as your main insurance and that Medicare supplement plan paying afterwards, almost everything would be taken care of. Again, you may be left with just a couple hundred dollars as a Part B deductible for the year, and then everything else could be covered for you. So for $400 a month to not have to pay $10,000 in leftover bills for some people ends up being actually the more cost-effective thing to do. One of the other perks of going with original Medicare from the government is your access to every Medicare provider across the United States as well as U.S. territories. So you don't have networks. You don't have to worry about, does my doctor take Humana? Do they take Anthem, Molina Healthcare, whoever? As long as they accept Medicare, you can go there and your supplement plan, your plan G, will follow you anywhere across the U.S. that Medicare is accepted. So you could go vacation in Florida. You could go have a second home in Montana. And as long as that doctor accepts Medicare, you can go there and you'll still continue to have almost no medical bills with that supplement. Next slide, please. For Advantage plans, this is the, that alternative option we talked about earlier. You are still responsible for paying the Part B premium. So even when you see those commercials on TV, it's a zero dollar plan. You are still paying the Medicare premium to the government. The government in return is just sending that money over to your Advantage plan company. So it kind of comes full circle there. Beyond that $174 per month for Part B, many Advantage plans across the U.S. are actually $0 per month. So they're getting all their money from the federal government. They are not requesting that you owe them any money in the form of a monthly premium. Now, are there plenty of plans in California, plenty of plans in Indiana that cost $50 bucks a month, $70 a month? Absolutely. But for many people, the $0 plans will have everything that they need for them. The biggest difference is really going to be your cost for medical bills. These tend to run much more like regular health insurance, where you kind of get nickeled and dimed when you actually go to the doctor. You may owe a $10 copay to see your primary every time. You may owe a $40 copay to see your specialist 
every time. You may owe 20% of that bill, 20% of this bill. So if you're going to the doctor a ton, you could owe potentially thousands of dollars in leftover medical bills. The nice thing is the Advantage plans actually do have a maximum out of pocket, even though the government's Medicare doesn't. So the national maximum in 2024 is $8,850. So no Advantage plan across the U.S. is allowed to let you pay more than that in leftover medical bills, even in your worst year. The average in Indiana, it's kind of closer to the average across the U.S., is right around $5,000, so far less than the national allowed amount, okay, but it's still thousands of dollars. The big perk is you're saving money in monthly premiums. At the end of the day, they're going to get you one way or another. It's more of a decision of when do you want to pay it. Do you want to pay it in high monthly premiums and know that all your medical bills are taken care of when you actually need to go to the doctor? Or do you want a cheaper monthly premiums only get nickeled and dimed when you actually need to receive medical services? Another potential downside of the Advantage plan is the networks. If you have a Humana Medicare Advantage plan, you'll want to make sure that you're going to doctors that accept that specific plan. If you leave California, you leave your region within California, you may have a difficult time finding doctors that accept your specific Advantage plan. So a lot less flexibility, a lot less, or excuse me, a lot more restrictive but it's a way that they can be more cost effective and keep their prices down and maybe a little bit of their profit up, to be honest. An advantage to the Advantage plans, I don't want to talk too bad about them. The advantage to them for many people would be the extra goodies. They include the Part D, they'll include dental, vision, hearing, a free gym membership to your local YMCA, maybe $20 a month to spend on over-the-counter items. It's just all the extra goodies that what I call the sugar on top to kind of sweeten the deal. You know, for this particular group with individuals who may be going to the doctor more than the average, higher medical cost than the average, this may be a scary option and maybe a financially unsafe option for many, knowing that you may be accumulating uh, higher than average medical bills throughout any normal year. So it seems more cost effective and premium and hey, I'm getting that free gym membership. But if you're left with $5,000 in leftover medical bills every year, you know, it probably would have been cheaper just to pay $125 a month for a Medicare supplement plan and have them take care of that for you. Okay, so just kind of thinking through that process out loud. Next slide, please. On these next two slides, these are just for this group's information. What I've done is kind of put a lot of what we've talked about today, how original Medicare, where the supplement works, who's it coming from, is it the government, is it an insurance company, as well as Medicare Advantage plans on the right. I'm gonna have you go to the next slide, please, Lynn. I think maybe another important slide to kind of help you lose some sleep tonight is who the usual candidate is. That's the big question I get is, Ben, if I was you, if I was your mother, they try to twist my arm, which one of these options would you want me to do? Am I an original Medicare person? Or am I an Advantage plan person? So what I've kind of done is broke this down into the usual candidate. It's very hard to say you need to be here and you need to be here. But there are three things that I would want everyone to consider. Okay, so we won't go through this slide just for time purposes today, but three things I want you to consider. Find finances, what I call financial risk or financial assessment. How much can you afford in monthly premiums for insurance versus how much could you afford in medical bills when you go to the doctor? Okay, if you can, if you would rather pay higher premiums to have no medical bills, maybe original Medicare with a supplement could be better. If you're someone who never really went to the doctor, you have to be dragged in the emergency room just to get a checkup every year, then maybe a Medicare Advantage plan could save you some money. You only pay for what you end up using. Then. So number one, finances. Number two, I want you to consider your current health. You'll notice the usual candidate on the left-hand side for the government's Medicare is typically someone coming onto Medicare with pre-existing conditions. They know, they know full well that they're an expensive healthcare consumer. They know full well they accumulate thousands of dollars in medical bills every year. Wouldn't it be nice to have somebody else pay those for you, like a Medicare supplement? Or again, based on your income, maybe Medi-Cal could cover those co-pays and deductibles for you and reduce those costs so that you don't have to pay them. Or maybe again, 
you're, you're the healthiest person in the world. You say, you know what? Medicare Advantage plan could be the best option for me. The last thing I want you to consider is your future health. The hardest thing to predict, but probably the most important thing to at least consider, we have my pre-existing conditions today. What's the likelihood they'll get worse in the future? What's my medical history, my medical experience going to look like at providers? How often am I going to the doctor the rest of my life? Something to at least consider. And that can help a lot of individuals make the decision and say, you know what, in the grand scheme of my entire lifetime, yes, having a Medicare supplement plan could feel awfully expensive. Okay, but I crunch the numbers, it actually ends up saving some money in the long run okay, by helping you avoid those medical bills. Next slide, please. All right, I know we're running a little bit over on time here. I'll try to wrap this up here today. I wanted to put this in this presentation for this group was just some really Medicare specific coverage uh, for individuals with bleeding disorders. So, you know, the big question is who's gonna cover my clotting factors um, and, and some of the specialized treatments uh, for bleeding disorders. The nice thing is Medicare Part B as in boy will treat this really as any other medical service or procedure just like an ambulance ride or durable medical equipment like a wheelchair. It's gonna go through Medicare Part B as in boy. The nice thing about that is Medicare is gonna cover 80% of that cost for you. You'll be left over with 20%. But remember, if you're deciding to go with the government's Medicare, it's highly recommended, wink, wink, okay, to get yourself a Medicare supplement plan or make sure you have some of that extra insurance like Medicaid that they can pay that 20% for you. Those clotting factors then become almost $0 out of your pocket with that combination of insurance. All right. All right. Let's go and move on to the next slide then for time purposes here today. All right, let's go and skip this one as well. All right, Medicare resources. We'll wrap this up here today. We've been talking enough about Medicare, I think, for this time. There is a SHIP program in every state across the U.S. as well as U.S. territories. So we call ourselves the Indiana State Health Insurance Assistance Program. In California, you guys are called HICAP, H-I-C-A-P. Same in Texas. Florida calls themselves SHINE, rightfully so. But we all get our money from the exact same place, and we're all here to provide local counseling and Medicare education to our state's Medicare beneficiaries. So look for that uh, Medicare counselor in your area. They are not allowed to be licensed insurance agents. They are likely affiliated with your state's Department of Insurance or your state's Division of Aging. They are simply educators, facilitators of information, and can handhold and be advocates throughout the entire Medicare process, including enrollment, as well as just complaints, problems, appeals, whatever you may need within Medicare including some Medicaid assistance as well. And those SHIP counselors can help you out. On the next slide, the last slide, you'll see my contact information. I know I'm in Indiana and three hours ahead of you guys, but you are truly welcome to reach out to me with any questions you may have. That is my direct phone number and my email. You can share that number with anyone. But of course, if you're looking for more local assistance, here is your HICAP or California Health Insurance Counseling and Advocacy Program, much longer name than us. There is their phone number and you can reach out to one of your local Medicare counselors from the same place I come from and they will be more than happy to help you out. I'll go ahead and turn this back to Lynn and maybe we'll answer some questions here for today. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, so also wanna make sure that everyone has our information. Um, happy to be of assistance here at the council as well, particularly if you have bleeding disorders and California specific questions regarding Medicare or your insurance. Um, and, and wanna thank our sponsors again, but we wanna um, open it up for questions as well. I know we're a little bit over time, but for those that may still have questions, we're happy to stay on for just a few more minutes and answer those questions. Um, thanks again to Ben for answering these. We did touch on it briefly as it relates to GHPP. Um, some folks may have the be on GHPP currently and may have some questions like, hey, you know, do I still have to go on Medicare? How does that work? Um, yes, they are going to encourage you over to um, 
to Medicare when you are, when that is age appropriate, um, you can have GHPP as a secondary, um, but GHPP will be the payer of last resort. So they will go to Medicare first and GHPP does not pay like co-pays and co-insurance. And so a, a big piece of that that you're really going to have to examine is, you know, if if you submit your GHPP application and based on your income, you don't have an annual enrollment fee, there is really no um, downside to having GHPP as a secondary and a backup. If you do have an annual enrollment fee, you're going to have to look at the cost in your specific situation and say, hey, is that GHPP covering something that Medicare is not? And therefore it's worth, you know, it, it, it pencils financially for me to keep that GHPP active. Um, and, and is it going to help out? So that's just something to consider. There are, there is an FAQ on GHPP's website about GHPP and Medicare that we can point you to. Um, so um, there is a question in the chat. Um, asking about the process for getting a Medicare for a loved one who is age eligible. eligible. Um, ben, you want to take that? Yeah, absolutely. So if you are helping someone who's maybe unable to sign themselves up for Medicare, they weren't automatically enrolled, or maybe they didn't sign up at 65 like they should have, for example, honestly, the easiest way to do it these days would just be to go to that Social Security website there's really no requirement that you have to be an authorized representative. I would say if that person is there with you, they've given you permission to do this or help them with that process, I would just simply encourage you to go to ssa.gov, that's Social Security's main website. Right on the homepage, you'll see a little button that says Medicare. When you click on that, you'll then see the applications for Medicare. They are probably anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes at most, very simple questions to answer. It's almost a formality, just gotta get through the application, hit submit, and then Social Security will handle the rest for the part A and B. It'll take about six weeks or so to get your Medicare card in the mail, but once you get that Medicare card in the mail, that's when you can sign up for anything else. Supplements, Advantage plans, Part D, you'll need that Medicare number or your Medicare card first, so that's step one. Yeah, and I would just reference back to the resources, Ben, that you mentioned earlier. In fact, I'm gonna flip back to that page. Um, you know, here are some good resources um, for folks that are needing, whether it's for yourself or for someone else. Um, and then the follow-up question that was in the chat related to that was asking, does GHPP help senior citizens? So GHPP is for specific diagnoses. Um, so it would depend on whether or not they have a qualifying condition, whether or not they would qualify for GHPP. Um, but yes, it's for anyone age 21 and over. So certainly it could still continue to help senior citizens. But again, they have to have a qualifying diagnosis. Um, now, another question in the chat, does original Medicare cover dental and vision? Sure. So the government's Medicare inherently does not cover routine dental, vision, or hearing benefits. There are some grumbles and mumbles within Medicare and the federal government of adding that in the future, but for the last how many decades now, it has not been included. So they won't cover teeth cleanings, won't cover eye exams or glasses. But keep in mind, they will cover problems. So if you have glaucoma, you need cataracts removed. Medicare does cover those types of medical procedures. They just exclude what they deem routine dental, routine vision, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then we had a question, does Medicare cover rare diseases and disabilities? Yes, absolutely. So Medicare really you know, hones in and very specific about certain uh, specific conditions like bleeding disorders, for example, those are covered. Really anything for the most part these days medically necessary will likely be a covered item on Medicare. That is not to say that Medicare doesn't have the same issues that we see in all insurance, getting prior authorization, proving things are medically necessary for you. Medicare though is a much easier program to work with in many regards as opposed to the private insurance companies you may be used to because they're not for-profit based. They tend to be a little bit more flexible at the very least. 
um, than profit for profit companies and are willing to maybe pay for a few extra days in the hospital, a few extra treatments or procedures, more so than even maybe the advantage plans do on Medicare. So yes, there should be coverage for most every condition you run into. Excellent. Um, I think that's all the questions that I saw in the chat. If anyone else has any other questions, please feel free to um, raise your hands or unmute and ask your question. Looks like maybe there's one more being typed in there. Um, but a uh, while, well, oh, uh, let's see. Do you have to be 65 to have Medicare? Yeah, so we touched on that maybe right at the beginning there. So there's really three main ways to qualify for Medicare. You either turn 65 years old, you're under 65, but you have to be on social security disability specifically for two years. Or lastly, you could be any age with end-stage renal disease. That's one particular condition that was kind of singled out due to some lobbying across the U.S. a while ago, uh, where they kind of got singled out and were actually given access to Medicare just simply based on their diagnosis of kidney failure. All right, but essentially age, disability, like social security disability, or kidney failure would be the only ways to qualify for Medicare. Yeah, and there's sub been several questions um, about like, you know, what it covers. Basically, yes, it like Ben already kind of reiterated this. Um, Medicare doesn't single out any particular condition and say, oh, we're only covering this or we're only covering yeah. that condition. Sort of any medically necessary treatment um, should get coverage if Medicare is, is your coverage. So, um, and yes, if you have, yeah, so if you're looking to go on Medicare, you're going to need to be 65 unless you're on disability. Um, there's no special exemptions for people with bleeding disorders to be out el eligible for Medicare earlier. Here in California, you may be eligible for Medi-Cal, depending on your income. That's our Medicaid program. And you are, based on a bleeding disorder, eligible for GHPP because the Genetically Handicapped Persons Program eligibility is based on your cut that you have a covered condition of which bleeding disorders are all included. So hopefully that helps clarify. Um those questions and no yeah and I, I think as well you know one of the things we i think we i had given a presentation i may, maybe some of you have met me in indianapolis at the national uh hemophilia conference there as well um we had kind of touched on a little bit that you know not everyone with a bleeding disorder would automatically of course qualify for disability and to be honest in many cases it's probably exceedingly difficult to actually to qualify for disability based on that depending on the severity and how it affects your working ability and livelihood. That tends to be a lot of the criteria there. So it is tough to get on disability. So to kind of reiterate for many of you, if you don't qualify for social security disability under 65, then yes, really your only way to get Medicare would be waiting until age 65. Um, yeah, exactly. But there are other options as far as your health insurance goes here in California mm -hmm. and in and in most of the rest of the country as well, depending on yeah. your income level, there could be some options um, as well. So I think hopefully we answered most of the questions either in the chat or on the line. Um, so please feel free again to reach out directly to Ben. His information is here. And um, we, as well as um, our information here at HCC, if you need any more information. And uh, we really appreciate everyone joining us this evening. Thank you, Ben, um, for being here for all this great information. I learned some things about Medicare tonight. So um, I hope the rest of you did as well. And um, look forward to connecting with anyone. So we, oh yeah, there is a question here. Um, let's see, sorry, about the recording. Yes, yeah, sorry if you had some Zoom issues. We will get the recording up on our YouTube channel and our website 
Um, hopefully by the end of the year, uh, it does take a little time sometimes for us to process them. Um, but you can also reach out to um, us via email if you need to follow up. And so um, my email and phone number is on the top of the screen right or on your screen right now. Feel free to jot that down. Um, if you didn't catch Ben's information, you can shoot me an email and I will get it to you. Um, so thanks everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.